Hello, everybody. Welcome to City Life. I'm Beverly Thompson. Now that we know what the plans are for the beginning of the school year for Durham Public Schools, and as more workplaces are opening back up for in-office employees, many parents are facing questions about child care. Knowing what a big issue this is going to be, it has been the focus of one of Durham's Recovery and Renewal Task Force roundtables since these groups were formed earlier this summer. Joining me to talk about what child care might look like in the coming months and the concerns and the questions that many of us have are Dr. Ibukun Akimboyo. She is the Medical Director of Pediatric Infection Prevention at Duke. And we also have June Shalito. She is the Director of Yates Baptist Church Development Center in Durham. Welcome and thank you both for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. Boyle, Thank you. Let's start it with you. You are a member of the Recovery and Renewal Task Force, and you've been an important voice in all of the discussions about how Durham can safely reopen. Why was it important to you to be a part of this work? Thank you for having me on here and thank you for that question. I think for me personally, I've, I've seen how we're all looking for ways to cohesively come together to create a solution. And I was eager to find a way to serve not just at my institution, but locally for the city, for Durham. And it's certainly an honor to, try, to find a way to participate and to learn from all of those around the table because we reflect different parts of Durham. We're not quite done with our work, but it's been an ongoing process. And I think for me, a true joy to be part of this. Great. June, uh, let's talk about your um, child care facility. What ages of children does your facility serve? And have you been closed for most of the time since March or have you been open? Yes, yeah, so good morning and thank you for allowing me to be a part of this discussion. So here at Yates, we serve babies, infants. We take infants at two months of age and we serve children through to age five when they transition up to kindergarten. And we've been open throughout the pandemic and uh, that was a hard decision. I'm sure it was a hard decision for just about every childcare director. You know, what was the right thing to do? And we made the decision partly because we're a mission of the church and we think it's important to serve our families. And we had some families who were essential workers who needed to be at work. And then our staff, in consultation with our staff, I found that majority of them wanted to stay working despite the possible threat to their health. And mm -hmm. so with those two things in mind, we chose to stay open. So tell me then, what have been some of your biggest concerns and what concerns have you heard from parents? Well, obviously, the number one concern for all of us is that we're afraid all the time that somebody may inadvertently bring the virus into the building, um, that they may be asymptomatic and not know that they have it and that it mm -hmm. would spread and that we would have teachers and children going home and potentially spreading it to their families. Um, we've been very fortunate up to this time. We haven't had a case. Um, we feel very, very fortunate. Mm. So that's one of our concerns. Another concern has been a financial concern. Just about every program right now is running very under-enrolled, and the way that programs uh, get money is through tuition, either mm. from private pay or from subsidy children. And so... Um, Without that tuition, how do we pay our staff and how do we continue to operate? And this is a real concern for many childcare programs at this moment. Certainly. And then with regard to parents, obviously they are very anxious. They're very anxious about bringing their child back. They're unsure what is the right thing to do and they need constant reassurance. Mm -hmm. So that leads me right to my next question. The big questions that so many parents have now is how is the coronavirus impacting children? I mean, it is actually hard to truly know since younger kids have been especially um, pretty sheltered over these past few months. So is that question is for the doctor. Yes, thank you. So Ms. Shalito has already started to allude to some of the direct impacts on children. And I think we may have to address this somewhat with the direct impact and then indirect impacts on children. When we think about kids in general, most of the information that's out there revolves around rates of infection. So how many children mm -hmm. in our community are actually infected? And of those that are infected, how often are they going into the hospital? And of course, unfortunately, how often does this lead to mortality or death? 
Um, and some people, particularly when you look at global data, um, have summarized this and said there, there, there's just been little impact on children. But I think we could word that a bit differently. I think we've seen lower rates of infection. And for the most part, that may be because we haven't put kids in settings where they are more likely to be infected. But also, and I think particularly important, even within settings that have remained open throughout the pandemic, and knowing that children are going back and forth from homes and households and back to a child care center, we haven't actually seen high rates of children passing it from one to another, which we see with a ton of viruses, such as the flu, influenza, or some of the other winter uh, respiratory viruses. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot more to learn about that. And I think we're going to find out why children seem to be slightly less impacted from a, just looking at direct infections and maybe why younger children are seem a little bit less likely to spread it quickly around the household. But lots more to learn on that. But I'm also particularly concerned about the indirect impact around the, the pandemic um, that's going to affect children both locally, so what's happening right now, and then also long-term effect. And what I mean by that are if parents are stressed, children are also stressed. If children don't have access to nutrition, they certainly are not growing properly. If we can't get education on track, I'm worried about what the long-term impact would be. And then I cannot even try to summarize the economic strain just overall and how that can have some level of impact on a child's mental health across all ages and how they interpret the world today or what their future might look like. So lots of direct, indirect effects, lots of things that we still need to work on and particularly need to focus our resources on in the next few weeks to months. So many things to think about, wow. So doctor, are there any concerns that this virus could start to mutate and impact more children eventually? We certainly worry about that. I There've been some early reports that suggest that the virus, there's slight mutations in the covering of the virus that may impact how quickly it spreads. I have not seen that actually suggest that children's, children become more likely to spread it across, say, a house or in a child care setting. Mm -hmm. So to that effect, I will say currently no, um, but potentially in the future, I think we should pay attention to this virus to see if and how it's changing. Okay, thank you for that. So June, how have you all operated and how have you addressed safety concerns? We continue to operate on our regular schedule. Um, some programs have opted to open later and, and close earlier for additional cleaning, but we've been fortunate here. We have a couple of people that arrive at 6.30 every morning to disinfect and we have a custodian that comes in in the evening that disinfects the facility. Um, and like many other businesses, we've been using technology to communicate with our parents that we don't see uh, mm -hmm. through Zoom calls and using Google Classroom. And since the pandemic first began, the Division of Child Development and Early Education and the Health, Health and Human Services Department have sent out many, many guidelines and recommendations to enable us to operate safely. Mm -hmm. And largely, this includes additional disinfecting and sanitizing. Parents no longer allowed to come in the building. They drop off and pick out outside. I apologize for the phone. Um, daily health checks, um, staff wearing masks, and keeping children with the same small group and the same caregivers. And following these and many other guidelines has enabled us to continue to operate safely. Okay, so um, thank you for that. And I understand you you have a job to do. <laughs> so Dr. Akinborio, now that we know that public school students of all ages in Durham will be learning online for at least the first nine weeks of this year, many parents are scrambling to figure out how to handle their work and the whole idea of going back to overseeing their children's schooling. <laughs> Parents are considering joining with other parents in what they call pods to switch off responsibilities, and others are even considering in-person camps. They're suddenly popping up as options and still looking at child care options that are being um, put out there by other community organ organizations such as churches. So here's the million dollar big question, okay? Um, if the whole point of not having children in school is to help stem the spread of the virus, but not having them together with other children, are options like these really what we should see happening? 
Yeah, I took a deep breath before approaching this one because it, this is going to be tricky. This might be hard to answer in a nutshell. You raise a very good point. The concerns around school reopening have been the fact that there is worry that if we put children back together in close indoor settings, there's a higher likelihood that they may interact it's going to be hard to just look at how children interact with each other. It's going to be hard to truly maintain that physical distance. And we also want to make sure we're creating a space that allows for learning. And some of the things we've put in place to prevent COVID-19 may actually go in direct. They may contradict other ways you can educate a child properly, especially with our younger children. So thinking about the three to six year olds that probably need more direct face to face interaction earlier on in life. So that being said, I think the ability for a group of kids or for a location to comply with all of our COVID-19 prevention strategies will likely reduce the rate of transmission in whichever setting that seems to happen in. We've preferentially suggested that should happen in a structured setting. And I say we, meaning lots of people in the medical profession, the AAP has come out, the American Academy of Pediatrics has come out and said, um, if we can, we should create an environment where children can go back to a structured setting. And mm -hmm. also, we're trying to reduce the disproportionate impact on Hispanic and Black children that has already occurred with the way in which this infection has decimated most of those communities. And I think I worry that setting up situations where if you're geographically or financially able to create a small capsule or bubble for your child, you're able to, and then others don't have access to that, may just for, further worsen this divide. But in mm -hmm. terms of transmission, I think realistically, even if schools open in person, some parents may have to kind of come together and have a backup plan for child care if there is a cluster in your school or your child care setting and the child can't actually go to school that week. Or if there's just something going on in the community, particularly if our community prevalence can, stays up or goes up. There's no way we can open schools in person if our community prevalence continues to rise. So we all kind of need to come together on some comprehensive plan that promotes equity and allows for structured education going forward. I'm not mm -hmm. opposed to it. I just worry about the impact. I see. Some things to think about. Uh, certainly, if you um, take into all of the considerations of how to do things safely, uh, that would be a help in mm -hmm. any of these um, situations, I imagine. So, June, as you know, Durham's Back on the Bull campaign will soon have an industry-specific self-certification reopening checklist for child care facilities. Until it's ready, there are enhanced health and safety guidelines from the state that licensed child care programs must follow during this pandemic. What are some of the guidelines outlined in the Child Care Strong North Carolina Public Health Toolkit? So there's various ones. I mean, one thing is that we have to have a designated staff person to meet children outside the facility. So parents are no longer allowed to come in. So we basically have parents drawing up in their cars and the staff person goes out and she wears a plastic visor because there has to be a barrier between herself and the parents. And she takes with her a non-contact thermometer, which she uses to take the temperatures of everybody in the vehicle. And if all the temperatures are good, she hands the parent a clipboard where they sign the child in and they can use their own pen or if they don't do that, we re-sanitize between users. Uh, infants have to be brought into the facility in a car seat, not carried in. Um, as we enter the facility, we have to have hand sanitizer outside the building. Then we have a hand washing station in the lobby. So everybody has to wash their hands in the lobby before they go down the hallway. And then um, there's a number of other things. Um, we sanitize or disinfect the building at 6.30 every morning, spray all the surfaces down. Um, we do that at the end of the day and we sanitize during the day. We wash hands very frequently. Uh, our teachers of the youngest children, infants, toddlers and twos, all have to wear something you might call a scrub gown, the kind of thing you might wear in a medical facility where it it comes down to the wrist and up to the neck, buttons up to the neck. And this is so to, to prevent uh, body fluids uh, touch, touching their skin. 
And should that happen, you know, because babies drool and they spit up, and should that happen, they need to wash and have a change of clothes available. Um, all food has to be plated. We usually do what we call family-style dining, where food gets passed around a table. We can't do that anymore. Everybody has an individual plate, which is separately plated. Um, we have to sleep the children at least six feet apart. Under normal regulations, it's three feet. Now it's six, and head mm -hmm. to toe. Um, we have to sanitize our toys throughout the day. So we have toy sanitizing stations set up that can be used throughout the day by the teachers. Um, and what else? Uh, and we well, all wear so masks. <laughs> we all wear masks all day. We wear masks uh -huh. and plastic visors throughout the day. Uh -huh. I haven't gone as far. Some programs are having children over the age of two wear masks. We haven't done that here yet. Parents are welcome to do it. It's just that I thought it might be, you know, children might be touching their faces more if they did that than if they were wearing one. So mm -hmm. we haven't done that as yet. So on the whole, have you found these guidelines to be helpful? Yes, absolutely. And I suspect that the reason why we've stayed strong and healthy up to this point is because we are implementing all these guidelines. I'm sure it has been a huge help. Uh -huh. Thank you. So Dr. Akinboyer, what are your biggest concerns from a child care perspective? You know, as we head into these coming months, you know, this is going to get cooler and, and um, diseases and other ailments are become more prevalent. What are some of the things that we really, first of all, should not be worried about and then things that we should be worried about? Yeah, like again, it may be hard to say what we shouldn't worry about because I think for every decision we, we have to incorporate COVID-19 and that just makes every decision harder. So just mm -hmm. can you just go out to see your neighbor? Can you go to see your grandma? Things like that. But I do think that improving child care in general and education and youth activities, I think we, we could shift our worry from trying to make schools a center for testing and things like that. We need to improve testing in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, but I think our focus on schools and on child care settings should revolve around keeping our staff members, keeping teachers and keeping children safe as they learn. Currently virtually, potentially in person, what that and how what, what would that look like? as we're hitting the flu season or influenza season where we know other respiratory viruses also spread. I think I'm encouraged to hear about what's going on in Ms. Shiluto's care center and some other care centers around the state. We've seen some clusters, but as far as I know, most of them have not resolved in large community outbreaks. They've been controlled, they've been centered around the child care setting. And the public health department is able, able to jump right in and help. But we also have to think through what adults with children in their household, either as parents, caregivers, or you have to interact with the child day to day, um, what they're going to do over the next few months and how they're going to handle the next few months. I don't know that we've set up a system where we have enough protection for parents. And I think people are frustrated, tired, and don't really see a future that will help them or that will lead to productivity that work or even to care for your child properly and so if we as a community can kind of come together around that and try to determine is it making sure we're all working to reduce this in our state in, in Durham particularly and I should pause and just give a lot of credit to what our public health department is doing locally what the mayor has been able to do uh, mayor show commissioner Jacobs through the task force but even with some of the other groups I know a lot of our leaders amongst both the um, our black Hispanic population have stepped up and just worked to mitigate this locally but if we can all do that I think we can start to have other options so businesses can reopen safely kids can go back to school safely and potentially start to improve what that outlook for the future looks like and just improve all of our sanity as we hit the next few months. Mm -hmm. We definitely have to work together. June, from a practical day-to-day -day operating standpoint, what are some of the biggest challenges that you've encountered in trying to comply with safety guidelines and in trying to keep all of your children, staff, and family safe? So there's been a number of challenges. One has been, especially in the early times, back in March and April, finding supplies, uh, paper towels, toilet tissue, <laughs> hand sanitizer, just the basics. Uh, masks, <laughs> just the basics. 
And also purchasing so many additional supplies has actually put a huge strain on our budget. And then there is a guideline which I understand, but it's harder for us to implement in that normally we would have a floater teacher or two floater teachers who move from classroom to classroom. The teachers can have bathroom breaks and take lunch. And we have to assign one person per classroom. Now we're a relatively small center. We only have five rooms. But mm. assigning a specific floater to a specific classroom is, again, a huge hit to our budget. And it's hard to, to do that. We're managing it, but it's not, not easy to do. Mm -hmm. And then social distancing. These are very young children. You know, it's just not possible to social distance yourself from a baby. <laughs> We have to change diapers. We have to hold these children. Um, with the older ones, um, we can do some things. We can try and encourage them to play with just one other or another child in a small group. We can divide our groups. We can um, go out on the playground in, in different groups. So there are things we can do. We can space children out at mealtime. So, you know, we can leave a seat between one child and another child. So there are things we can do. Um, but it is hard with, with young children because although the older ones understand and they can tell us all about the coronavirus and social distancing and hand washing and mm -hmm. they can tell us all about it, it's still um, these children need love and nurturing and that means contact. And so, you know, that, that is hard for the teachers too, I think. So we wear masks and we try to distance ourselves, but we also recognize that we want these children to still feel loved and, and, and nurtured. Mm -hmm. Certainly takes a lot of planning and effort, it seems, uh, very conscious planning and effort. Um, but Dr. Akinboyo, what do you think we really need to see happen in order for students to be able to safely return to school for the second nine weeks? So return to in-person school, I'm going to presume, since I think in Durham, at least, most students will be starting school online. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we may have to decide what, it, what we want to prioritize as a local community. And if we're prioritizing children, we're going to put schools before everything else. Mm -hmm. And that means whatever guidance we're coming out with, whatever policies and how we reopen society has to reflect the concerns of our teachers, schools, parents and all, all of the staff members that tend to be associated with schools. And as you all know here, as you could just talk about dropping a child off in school and the, the child has to interact with the bus drivers, the crossing guard and all of that. So there's just so many nuances to getting a school open. Mm -hmm. I already alluded to this, but as a community, we need to target getting our local prevalence low enough that all of the things that are instituted within schools would mean that Possibly a smaller group of kids can start off in school and start off in person and not lead to a rapid outbreak in coronavirus or COVID-19 in our community. And we've seen that successfully done in Europe and Asia. The uh -huh. issue is we're very different in terms of our current prevalence. So the number of people that are infected in our community. Um, in terms of comparing that to Europe and Asian countries that have actually reopened schools, we're not quite at the same level. So we need to get mm -hmm. lower. Mm -hmm. And that takes wearing a mask, washing your hands, and yes, still staying, stay, staying relatively distant from people that are not within your household. Uh -huh. You could also stay. It's been a few long months. Everyone's tired. And so if there are ways to do this and do it safely, I think some people have figured out outdoors are certainly safer right now than indoors. If you are going mm -hmm. to meet with someone that's not in your household, wearing a mask and kind of keeping that um, it's keeping that as a forefront of your goals in the next few weeks can help mm -hmm. get kids back to school. Uh -huh. Good advice. June, is there anything that you thought would be a challenge that really has not been as hard as you thought it would be? Um, so I guess when this virus first hit, as, and I'm talking as an administrator now, for me, what was the most challenging thing was just the vast amount of information that we, that was sent out to us. Mm -hmm. Um, there were multiple webinars, there were online trainings, there were updates, all this information came to us and we had to absorb it and somehow process it and make sense of it so we could put the recommendations into practice. But once we'd done that, um, we found that we could breathe much more easily and now it's just become a sort of a routine. So we've, we're just doing what we have to do now daily and it's just a part of life here. 
So initially, I guess it was challenging and we've, we saw it as challenging, but now it's just a part of the day and it's no longer really that hard to do. Mm. And one sort of a side effect of this, I had a discussion with a parent whose child actually go to a different centre and what he said to me was that initially he was really nervous about putting his children in childcare, but what's happened is that they've actually been healthier. So whereas under normal circumstances, you know, we have runny noses in a centre and we don't think too much about it. Now, the child can't be here until they've been tested or checked out by a pediatrician. So mm-hmm. actually, he said the children have been healthier than, than normal. Well, that's certainly a, a positive outcome. <laughs> yes. Look at it that way, huh? <laughs> but, uh, so, Dr. Akinboyo, is there a difference in risk between elementary, middle, and high school students? In terms of COVID-19 transmission? Yes. Um, yes, briefly, yes. Basically, what we've seen is the risk of getting the infection from someone that's in your household or someone that you're exposed to, that risk seems to be lower in younger kids. And mm-hmm. it's more consistently kids that are less than, say, about 10. So from, for schools, that would mean pre-K, preschool, kindergarten, and maybe elementary school. And the risk in middle school and high schoolers, so older kids, seems to be similar to adults in terms of acquiring uh-huh. the infection when you're exposed to someone and also potentially spreading it. So it's much more important in the older age group to, to focus on mask compliance. I think most of them can likely comply with putting on something on their face or a face shield if that's what works in that setting. Um, and separating when they can. That may be harder to do for those ages just because of what they prefer to or how they prefer to spend time. Um, But yes, there's a slightly different risk in getting the infection and spreading it. Seems Mm -hmm. to be lower in younger kids, slightly higher, or maybe reflect adult risk in the older middle schoolers to high schoolers. Uh So, Doctor, certainly when we're talking about child care for younger children, the CDC has special recommendations in addition to standard social distancing practices. What are some of these? Yeah, I think Ms. Schlitter has actually addressed a lot of them and Mm -hmm. just with their day-to-day practices. I can Uh highlight a couple more, and I'm hopeful that by doing all those things to prevent COVID-19, we may start to see... uh, this other effect on other respiratory viruses where we don't have children that just get their daycare virus every month uh, Mm -hmm. because all of the viruses are being prevented. But I think for the most part, there is a lot more focus and um, some guidance around how children interact. So keeping a child within one cluster, if it's going to be a classroom, keep that classroom together. Because if there is an exposure, you can trace who exactly interacted with who and where uh, where the spread can happen. Mm-hmm. Hand washing, doing it in a child-friendly way. So not all uh, high alcohol content needs to be in a childcare setting. Sometimes mm-hmm. you may need to encourage soap and water, um, but most kids can actually use hand sanitizers and use it safely. And mm-hmm. then just getting into the habit of cleaning and sanitizing. I think most centers already do this, most schools do this, but but making it more routine and building it into how we teach our children, apologies for that, um, how we teach our children, making the child become part of cleaning the environment, I think mm-hmm. are newer guidance that have come out, but likely emphasize what's already been done. I see. All right. Thank you. So, Jen, we saved one of the most important questions for last. How in the world have the children been through all of this? Do they seem worried, scared, or, you know, some children maybe just taking it all in stride? Well, amazingly, the children that we have here just seem to be taking it in their stride. Um, Mm -hmm. Before they return to the centre, we do ask parents, you know, talk with your children, tell them that we're wearing masks, tell them that you will drop them off outside and pick them up outside. Um, And they have seen their teachers um, on Google Classroom, so they've seen us wearing masks. Mm -hmm. And the amazing thing to me is that they will talk to me as though the mask and the visor is not there. They Uh just... Hardly seem, hardly seem to notice it. Um, so I'm sure that there are children that have been impacted somewhat by this. I mean, we're all living in a very stressful environment right now, For undoubtedly. Sure. And it may be that some of this anxiety will come out in the future. Mm-hmm. But for right now, um, what we see here is that largely we're just carrying on day to day and it doesn't seem to be impacting them too much. 
Um, I mean, I would suggest that if you have a child and you are concerned, or if you're an adult and you have concerns, that you contact um, a pediatrician or a psychologist and have some conversations because this is undoubtedly a stressful situation for everyone, not mm -hmm. just you know the children here. And um, the CDC does have some recommendations. You know, they suggest that we, you know, obviously remain calm. We try not to make children feel anxious about the situation. We listen, we talk, um, we did purchase. There's already some books available for young children about the pandemic. Seemed amazing to me that they got out that quick, but there are some. Yes. And um, mostly to talk with children about how they can protect themselves. You know, I wash hands. That's the main thing, wash hands and, you know, stay distant from people that you aren't normally around mm -hmm. so that you protect yourself and others. I mean, that's the main thing. Uh -huh. What about your staff? How are they handling it emotionally I, in terms of the changes that have been making as well as being a, an important source for the children, you know, whose parents have had to go back to work outside of the home? So, um, in general, I think we're doing very well, which again is, is somewhat amazing. And I think to some extent, this situation, because we've sort of had to work together to make it work, in a way, I think it's drawn us closer and we've become perhaps a stronger team than we were before. We've also tried to make sure that we've all had time to take time off. So, we were fortunate here to get help from the Paycheck Protection Program which has enabled, and because we have low enrollment numbers too, we've been able to make sure that everybody's had time to stay home for a while, to take a week mm -hmm. or two weeks off, just to basically get away from the situation and take a breather. And mm -hmm. I think that was important too. And mm -hmm. it's also important to note that emotional support is available. They have set up a hotline. It's called Hope for Healers, and this is for childcare professionals. So if anybody out there feels like they need to talk to somebody, that number is 919-226-2002. And I would encourage anybody out there, if they feel they need to, yes, reach out and, and talk to someone. All right. Well, thank you both so much for joining me to talk about this really important topic. Is there anything else that you feel like you need to add to help the parents and maybe even some of the younger uh, children out there uh, who might be watching uh, as we try to get through this whole uncertain time. I guess I can go first. Thank you again for having me on here, for having us on here. I'm grateful to parents, child care providers, really anyone that has to uh, provide some kind of interaction or care for a child because this has been there has been no way to prepare for this. And I think everyone is just trying to figure out how to do this well. So mm -hmm. probably uh, the one last thing I'll mention is we should encourage people to focus on what the data shows and try and ensure that we have good science that we're following. There's just so much noise out there and we're there's a lot more politics into decisions that should be amongst all of us with in terms of just community goals and protecting our children. So now more than ever, we need to come together around what our goals are as communities and somewhat try to limit the noise and f focus on good information, good data. And one of which is I'm grateful for all of the people you've had on your platform to share information around COVID-19. So thanks for having me. Well, thank you for joining us. June, is there anything you'd like to uh, end the program with? Yes. So again, thank you um, to having this opportunity. It's important to be able to talk about this. And I think that's the thing I found over the last few months that we need, we all need to talk about it. We all need to try and reassure each other and, and make ourselves feel better, actually. So what I would say to parents right now is you, if you have a child in childcare or if you're considering going back, please call your child centre director and talk to them. And try and be reassured we are doing the very best we can to keep your child safe and I think it's also important to know that children do need peer-to-peer -peer interaction so if you're not able to bring your child back to care then find another family that you feel comfortable with your child being around and so that the children do get that peer-to-peer -peer contact it's very important mm -hmm. and the other thing is that the childcare industry has been very affected by this pandemic um, and there is some substantial concern that some programs will close and not reopen, and therefore we won't mm -hmm. have enough childcare spaces. So what I would say now is that if we could all try and work together as a community, wear our masks, wash our hands, stay distant from each other for as long as we need to, we could 
at least eliminate some of the risk that we're all, you know, being around at this point and hopefully get back to normality um, as fast as possible. Anyway, so thank you for the opportunity. I've enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you both for joining me to talk about this very important topic. I really appreciate you taking the time. Well, that does it for City Life. Don't forget to follow us on social media. Watch us on the Durham Television Network and on YouTube. And you can listen to our podcast now on iTunes. I'm Beverly Thompson. Thank you for joining me to learn more about City Life in Durham. Uh-huh.